With NASA's recent announcement of a telescope base to be stationed on the moon, not to mention Elon constantly threatening to leave us behind and go live on Mars, it is a fixer-upper of a planet. How would we actually go about breathing on another planet when we finally got there? The very first results are in from NASA's project MOXIE, a piece of technology that hitched a ride on the Mars Perseverance rover that is now shown to be able to create oxygen out of thin air on the Martian planet. This topic absolutely fascinates me. How, when we finally do arrive on another planet, would we actually go about surviving there? I want to look at where we've come from and what technology we have to hand at the moment, the current state of the art that's being used on Mars right now by NASA, but also a piece of technology that might change the game entirely due to the nature of the Martian atmosphere. So let's dive in. The Martian atmosphere consists of mostly carbon dioxide, about 95%, and nitrogen, about 3%, with only very minor traces of oxygen. In order to live, breathe, and ultimately explore the Martian planet, we need to work out how to survive there. Now your mind might naturally jump to the crews aboard the International Space Station as a logical place to start. Why aren't we just using these tried and tested systems to support a base on Mars? If the oxygenator breaks, I'm gonna suffocate. If the water reclaimer breaks, I'll die of thirst. Matt Damon's got it exactly right here. To understand why, we need to look at how we currently survive in extreme environments. Let's start with level one, the take it with you approach to sustaining life. References in history of submarines may date back as far as 332 BC, with Alexander the Great going down into the sea in a glass barrel, kind of like a diving bell, to explore the ocean depths. The glass dome contained a normal amount of air at normal pressure with no backup supply or way of cleaning or reprocessing the atmosphere to give it further life-sustaining duration. As you continue to breathe, you slowly convert the available oxygen into carbon dioxide until the oxygen levels are too low to support life. In one retelling of this story though, Alexander takes down with him a cockerel, a cat, and a dog. The cockerel keeps time, the dog is to be inflated to quickly rise to the surface in case of emergency, I'm not quite sure what the physics is behind that one, but it's the cat's job to act as a rebreather to purify the vessel's atmosphere. Now, historical accounts probably departed somewhat from reality at some duration of this story, particularly if you have allergies, but the idea in principle is a smart one and brings us very quickly to level two. Take it with you and clean it. The longest publicly acknowledged submarine mission was 111 days by the Royal Navy's Valiant class submarine HMS Warspite. The ISS has been in continuous operation for over 20 years. What does it take to keep breathable oxygen available for this time? There are two interconnected systems that enable long-term life support, the Water Reclamation System, the WRS, and its survivability companion, the Oxygen Generation System, or OGS. The WRS collects water from urine, humidity, and condensation and purifies it into drinkable water, albeit slightly disgusting. In the words of astronaut Douglas Wheelock, yesterday's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. The water that is produced from this system apparently tastes a bit like bottled water as long as you can psychologically get past the point that it is 98% recycled urine and sweat. From the WRS, a small amount of water is siphoned off to make breathable air for the ISS crew using something called electrolysis. The oxygen generation system runs an electric current through water to produce its components, hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is dispersed for breathing, which the crew likes, but you might be asking what happens to the flammable hydrogen gas that is produced to avoid turning the ISS or a submarine into the Hindenburg. One option would be to vent it, but in space, you want to do this as little as possible, particularly on Mars, as the more products lost from your closed environment, the more you'll need to resupply the starting materials. Hydrogen can still be useful, so it's fed back into something called the Sabatier system, which collects waste carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and combines it with hydrogen to create water and methane, as well as some heat. The water is fed back into the water system and the heat into the heat exchange system. The methane though is a bit of a dead end in this process, at least for now. Methane combustion could be used to generate heat and energy, but fire needs fuel, a heat source and oxygen. So burning methane would use up the precious oxygen that was why the methane was created in the first place. What I think is really interesting is that on Earth, we think about keeping molecular systems topped up. H2O, gas for cooking, food. In space, you worry more about your supply of atoms, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. 
because you can assemble them into the molecules that you need. Methane, at the moment though, is considered a waste product, so it is vented out into space. To keep the system working, fresh water is periodically introduced into the system to top up the crew's supplies. Now in a submarine, this is reasonably straightforward as they're surrounded by water, but on the ISS, or say on Mars, this presents our main problem with level two systems, resource leakage. At some point, enough resources will have been leaked away or become irretrievably waste products that insufficient materials for life will exist in the system. One way around this, let's call it level 2.1 because it's not that much of a leap forward, is the take it with you, clean it, and bring a high density resupply methodology with you. Not only is this not a very catchy title, it still will run into a limit of running out eventually, but still, we do do it. On board the ISS are solid fuel oxygen generators developed by the Russian space agency which use containers of powdered sodium chlorate and iron to produce oxygen. When the canisters are heated to 600 degrees celsius, the sodium chlorate begins to break down into sodium chloride and oxygen gas. In 1997, one of the solid fuel containers was accidentally ignited on the Soviet Union's later Russia's own space station, Mir. The searing flames lasted for several minutes and cut off access to one of the two Soyuz escape vehicles, but ultimately the crew was able to extinguish the flames with no damage to the station's superstructure. As you can imagine, nothing goes together better than oxygen and heat, particularly in space, so most crews rely on canisters of pressurized oxygen brought up during refueling missions instead to top up any minor leaks across the station for longer, less critical time periods. But the reality of these systems is that they are tethered to Earth, always eventually needing resupply. How would we go about producing breathable air on Mars from the materials already there? This brings us to level three make it when you get there. And on NASA's Perseverance rover, which landed back on Mars in 2021, there is a piece of technology capable of doing exactly that. MOXIE, or the Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, it feels like we aren't even trying with acronyms anymore, the In-Situ Resource Utilization, a fancier name for level three, is a technical way of describing what most of us might call living off the land. We'll just have to live off the land. How do we take the molecular composition we have on Mars and make it livable for human beings? Unlike on the ISS, there isn't an easily available water supply to turn to on Mars to produce oxygen. You'd have to travel either to the far north or to the south to find ice, or potentially to mine for ice buried deep underground. So instead, MOXIE uses CO2 and splits it to produce oxygen using a technology called solid oxide electrolysis. It's a bit like burning a fuel source or running a fuel cell, but in reverse. A scroll compressor pulls Martian atmosphere from outside the rover through a filter and pressurizes it to about half an atmosphere. The pressurized CO2 gas is then fed into the solid oxide electrolyzer, the SOX, where it is electrochemically split at the cathode to produce pure oxygen. The SOX operates at 800 degrees Celsius, requiring a sophisticated thermal isolation system, including input gas preheating and exhaust gas cooling. The reason MOXIE is gold is to help limit the heat produced during operation from affecting the other instruments of perseverance. The byproducts of this process are carbon monoxide and unused CO2. But a major limitation of this process is that if the system is run too hard and both of the oxygen atoms are stripped from the carbon dioxide, then the remaining carbon can affix to the device called coking, which quickly destroys the instrument. MOXIE has been hard at work over the last 2.5 years operating and to date has produced about 122 grams of oxygen, which this is absolutely my favorite part of the story, is just about enough to keep a small dog alive for around 10 hours, which from now on, this is the only unit of measurement that I will acknowledge. This isn't a lot, but it also sounds like a lot less than it actually is, which is a confusing statement. MOXIE wasn't and hasn't been running continuously during that 2.5 year period. It was turned on and then off for just very short periods at a time, once every couple of months, typically producing about six grams of oxygen per hour, with a maximum achieved of 12 grams per hour. Now for comparison, you're probably using about 10 grams of oxygen per hour whilst you're watching this video, assuming that you aren't jogging in place or doing anything else. Now, why is this so little? It takes a huge amount of power to pull apart CO2 molecules, and the Perseverance rover is only capable at the moment of producing a little bit over 100 
100 watts, as it's powered by the heat of radioactive decays on board. And most of the time, that energy is needed to run other experiments. If we're going to make useful amounts of oxygen in the future, we'll need a much larger power plant, but also a lot more power. A major challenge for level three in situ resource utilization systems that use CO2 is that CO2 is a very stable molecule inherently, meaning it requires a lot of energy to decompose or pull apart. Although MOXIE's solid oxygen electrolysis cells are very robust technologies, it is very energy inefficient and also requires limited and expensive rare earth metals to work. The nature of the Martian atmosphere is also against them. Solid oxygen electrolysis cells operate best at high temperatures and high pressures, the opposite of the Martian atmosphere, which is why they need the compressor at the pre-stage and the 800 degree oven to operate. In the future though, there could be an approach that works even better on Mars than it does on Earth. This approach is called low temperature plasmas. To remove oxygen from CO2, you need to introduce enough energy into the molecule that it can no longer hold itself together. You can do this by hitting it hard with an electron, heating it up to very high temperatures so they collide and knock off atoms, or by shaking the molecule apart. In a molecule like CO2, the bonds between the carbon and the oxygen atoms can be encouraged to vibrate in various modes, symmetrical modes, asymmetrical, and bending modes. If these vibrations are large enough, they can cause the molecule to spontaneously decompose. And it's about 10 times easier to excite internal vibrations of a molecule by comparison to directly splitting it apart by something like electron impact. By accelerating electrons through a gas using an applied electric field, energy can be channeled directly into these vibrational states of the gas molecules, exciting them. This can produce a low temperature plasma where only a small fraction of the total gas molecules are actually ionized. Without getting too deep into the exchange of vibrational quanta, bringing many CO2 molecules that are vibrating asymmetrically together results in a really interesting phenomena. Where two molecules with slightly different energies couple with each other, the energy of the interaction is preferentially added to the higher energy molecule, making its amplitude of vibration increase even more. This causes the less energetic molecule to reduce its amplitude. As this process continued, the up pumped molecules, the excited molecules, amplitudes get so big they spontaneously disassociate, producing carbon monoxide and atomic oxygen. This makes low temperature plasmas a really powerful way of turning electrical energy into chemical energy. And this general idea to use plasmas to decompose CO2 is actually being pursued on Earth, prompted by the problems of climate change, but it turns out it's really hard to do in the Earth atmosphere due to the ambient temperatures and pressures on the planet, which means that electrons collide too often and are difficult to accelerate to the required energies. The atmospheric pressure on Mars, however, of about 600 pascals, about 150 times lower than on Earth, is close to the ideal advantageous plasma operation zone, removing the need for things like vacuum pumps or compressors on the first steps of the process. The Martian atmosphere is also much colder than Earth, ranging from about minus 150 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, which promotes the up pumping mechanism and helps to slow down the conversion of carbon monoxide and oxygen back into CO2, meaning that the heating step of the solid oxygen electrolytes also isn't required and also giving more time to separate oxygen out of the mixture before it recombines. As a result, these low temperature plasma systems can operate at significantly lower energy requirements. I've seen some papers aiming for about 25 watts for continuous operation, but these are all lab-based experiments at the moment. However, they may be a pivotal step towards the installation of scalable in situ resource utilization technologies on the red planet. It will take a pantheon of technologies to get us to future planets, but a way to provide continuous production of consumable oxygen and usable fuel straight from the Martian atmosphere may be the most important. A giant leap for mankind and a significant contribution towards the viability of manned missions to Mars and to the sustainability of a future colony. We still have t-shirts available of your favorite scientist in the style of a rock metal band t-shirt. If you'd like one, I'll leave a link in the description down below. Thank you for excusing my slightly husky voice that I've had during this episode. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.